Okay, my friends, uh, good morning again, and our lecture is about endometriosis. First of all, it's necessary to define what is it, endometriosis. Endometriosis is an estrogen-dependent chronic inflammatory disease with aberrant growth of ectopic outside the uterine cavity, endometrial tissue, glands, and stroma, my friends. Be very attentive for this definition. Very often students pick that. Endometriosis is uh, the process which is characterized by glands and stroma of endometrium outside uterus, my friends. It's wrong because of normal location of, endometri of endometrial tissue is only endometrial lining. Its importance is due to its distressing symptomatology, association with infertility, invasive potential, agent organs, organs, difficulty in being diagnosed. The incidence of endometriosis is difficult to quantify as women with the disease are often asymptomatic initially. Moreover, imaging modalities have low sensitivities of small implants. In asymptomatic women, the prevalence of endometriosis ranges from 6 to 11 percent, depending on the population studied and mode of diagnosis. One third of women with chronic pelvic pain have visualized endometriosis. From 5 to 15 percent of women undergoing gynecological laparotomies and in unexpected findings in 50 percent of these cases demonstrate this pathology. Incidence is more 30 to 40 percent in infertile group of patients. Endometriosis is predominantly found in women of reproductive age, but has been reported in adolescents and in postmenopausal women receiving hormonal replacement. Following menopause, it regresses unless estrogen is prescribed. It is the evidence of role of hormones in pathogenesis. But about 5% of new cases develop in postmenopausal age group. We shall explain it later. It is found in women from all ethnic and social groups. Several hypotheses have been used to explain the various manifestations of the disease and its various location. It's a retrograde menstruation theory, the Mullerian metaplasia theory, the lymphatic spread theory, the hematogenous spread theory. First, the retrograde menstruation theory of Samson proposes that endometrial fragments that are shed during menstruation are transported through the fallopian tubes then becoming implanted and growing in various intra-abdominal sites. These endometrial fragments are viable and uh, capable of growing in viva and in vitro. The Mullerian metaplasia theory of Mayer proposes that endometriosis results from the metaplastic transformation of peritoneal mesothelium to endometrium under the influence of certain identified stimuli. The lymphatic spread theory of Halden suggests that the lymphatic draining the uterus transport endometrial tissue to various pelvic site where it grows ectopically. The hematogenous spread theory explains the presence of endometrial tissue in distant sites, lungs, brain, and other distant sites. Pathogenesis is not fully understood yet. 
Genetic predisposition, the risk of endometriosis is seven times greater if a first degree relative has been affected by endometriosis. A relative risk for endometriosis of 72% has been found in mothers and sisters and a 75% incidence has been noted in homozygotic twins of patients with endometriosis. Immunological changes have been reported to clearly play a role. The immune system may be altered in women with endometriosis and the disease may develop as a result of reduced immunologic clearance of viable endometrial cells from the pelvic cavity. Decreased cell-mediated cytotoxicity toward autologous endometrial cells has been reported to be associated with endometriosis. Macrophages or other cells may promote the growth of endometrial cells by secretion of growth and the angiogenetic factors such as epidermal growth factor, macrophage-derived growth factor, fibronectin, and adhesion molecules such as integrins. The cytokines in peritoneal fluid of women with endometriosis are elevated and they release interleukin-8. Why don't all menstruating women develop endometriosis? It has been found that the amount of exposure to retrograde menstruation and the woman's immunological response are most critical. Researchers have found differences in the chemical composition and the biological pathways of the endometrial cells in women who have endometriosis in comparison to those who don't. They have also found a difference in the inflammatory mediators and the growth factors in the peritoneal fluid of those with endometriosis in comparison to those without. At this picture, you see the sum of all factors, pathogenetic factors of the development of endometriosis. There are environmental, endocrine, immunological factors, factors associated with genes, epigenetic modification, all of them together lead to the appearance, to the development of this complex disease. What about risk factors for endometriosis? There are newly parity, infertility, reproductive age, usually late teens to 40s, a first degree relative with endometriosis, regular menstrual cycle less than 27 days, prolonged menses of eight or more days. Sites of occurrence of endometriosis. Common sites are fallopian tubes, ovaries, uterosacral ligament, rectovaginal septum, pelvic peritoneum, pouch of Douglas, sigmoid colon, appendix, pelvic lymph nodes. Rare and remote sites, umbilicus, abdominal scar, Episiotomy scar, brain, lungs, pleura, ureter, kidney, arms, legs, nasal mucosa. For the correct diagnosis and the treatment of endometriosis, it's better to separate endometriosis into different groups. First division of endometriosis is into two groups genital and the extragenital. 
among of genital endometriosis, we separate external and internal endometriosis. Internal endometriosis means that uterine corpus is affected by the disease. External endometriosis can be intraperitoneal and extraperitoneal. Representatives of intraperitoneal endometriosis are such sites as uterosacral ligaments, fallopian tubes, ovaries, pelvic peritoneum, pouch of Douglas, rectovaginal septum. Extraperitoneal forms of external genital endometriosis are cervix, vagina, perineum locations. Logically, extragenital endometriosis includes umbilicus, abdominal scar, episiotomy scar, brain, lungs, pleura, urethra, kidney, arms, legs, nasal mucosa, and the other sites are the sites of extra genital locations. Most commonly found in the dependent portion of the pelvis. Ovaries thrust. Two out of three women with endometriosis have ovarian location of the disease. Next, fallopian tubes. Next, broad ligament, then peritoneal surface of the cul de sac, fifth, recta vaginal septum. In this picture, you see schematically where endometriosis can appear. The endometrium glands and stroma in the ectopic sites has got the potential to undergo changes under the action of ovarian hormones. While proliferative changes are constantly evidenced, the secretory changes are conspicuously absent in many, maybe due to deficiency of steroid receptors in the ectopic endometrium. Cyclic growth and the shedding continue till menopause. The periodically shed blood may remain in cyst or else the cyst becomes tense and ruptures. As the blood is irritant, there is dense tissue reaction surrounding the lesion with fibrosis. If it happens to occur on the pelvic peritoneum, it produces adhesions and the puckering of the peritoneum. If in cyst, the cyst enlarges with cyclic bleeding. The serum gets absorbed in between the periods and the content inside becomes chocolate colored. Hence, the cyst is called chocolate cysts, which is commonly located in the ovary. Pathology. The islands of endometrium are sensitive to ovarian hormones. Logically, estrogen similar to lining of endometrial cavity lead to the proliferation of endometrioid cells outside the uterine lining. Regression of corpus luteum and removal of estrogen and progesterone causes them to slough. This slower debris induce a profound inflammatory response that causes significant pain and long-term fibrosis. Macroscopical appearance depends on the site, size, time since implantation, and day of menstrual cycle. Color is good indicator and is determined by the vascularity of the lesion. The presence of fibroids 
the size of the lesion, and the presence of residual slowed material. It varies from red, brown, black, white, yellow. New implants are commonly red blood-filled active lesions. Elder lesions scarred with a puckered appearance. At this picture, you see the typical and atypical lesions of endometriosis. Left, side, left part of slide demonstrate blue coloration of peritoneal cavity of ovarian surface dissimilar to atypical endometriosis, which are yellow-brown, red endometriosis, peritoneal defect, and white endometriosis. Uncommon situation when you see the combination of different atypical representatives of endometriosis. Microscopically, two out of four must be present in the biopsy specimen to confirm diagnosis. There are endometrial epithelium, endometrial glands, Endometrial stroma, hemosiderin laden macrophages. Different locations and the endometriosis of the ovary. I am repeating the most common site of endometriosis among of all genital, intraperitoneal endometriosis. There are cysts filled with thick chocolate colored fluid which may have a black terry consistency sometimes this characteristic fluid represents aged hemolyzed blood and the desquamated epithelium the glands and stroma lining the cysts wall may be destroyed due to an increase in pressure this leaves behind a fibrotic wall with infiltrating hemosiderin laden macrophages. At this picture, you see left side surgical specimen of an ovary containing an endometrioma. Picture B dark chocolate like fluid had filled. This cyst you see already ruptured cyst, a ruptured endometrial cyst. Endometrioma is microscopical presentation. In ovarian endometriomas, endometrial type epithelium and the subgiant stroma line the cyst and are bordered peripherally by ovarian stroma. The golden brown pigment in the cyst wall is hemosiderin, indicating remote hemorrhage. Debris composed of necrotic and the degenerating cells and the remote hemorrhage occupies the interior of the cyst. It is the remote hemorrhage that confers the chocolate-like color to cyst fluid. Clinical picture of patients with endometriomas. About 25% of patients with endometriosis have no symptoms being accidentally discovered either during laparoscopy or laparotomy. Symptoms are not related with extent of lesion. Even when the endometriosis is widespread, there may not be any symptom. Conversely, there may be intense symptoms with minimal endometriosis. Depth of penetration is more related to symptoms rather than the spread. Lesions penetrating more than 5 millimeters are responsible for pain 
This minoria and this parionia. It's easy to explain. You understand, I believe, that in deep invasion of endometriosis, nerves are already involved into the process and produce different kinds of pain. Non-pigmented endometriotic lesions compared to the classical pigmented powder burns lesions produce more prostaglandin F and hence are more painful. The symptoms are mostly related to the site of lesion and its ability to respond to hormones. Midline lesions are more symptom producing. Degree of pain is not related to the severity of endometriosis. The characteristic symptoms of this disease are dysmenorrhea and dyspareunia. Dysmenorrhea. This is progressively increasing secondary dysmenorrhea. The pain starts a few days prior to menstruation, gets worsened during menstruation and takes time even after cessation of period to get relief of pain, commenstrual dysmenorrhea. Pain usually begins after a few years of pain-free menses. The site of pain is usually deep-seated and on the back or rectum. Increased secretion of PGF 2 alpha thromboxane beta 2 from endometriotic tissue is the cause of pain also. Dyspareunia. The dyspareunia painful intercourse is usually deep. It may be due to stretching of the structures of the pouch of Douglas or direct contact tenderness. As such, it is mostly found in endometriosis or of the rectovaginal septum of pouch of Douglas and with thick retroverted uterus. Abnormal menstruation. About 20% of patients have this symptom. Menorrhagia is the predominant abnormality. If the ovaries are also involved, Polyminoria or epimenorrhagia may be pronounced. There may be premenstrual spotting. Infertility. 40 to 60 percent of patients suffered from this problem. Whether endometriosis causes infertility or infertility produces endometriosis, it's not always clear. Endometriosis is found in 20 to 40% of infertile women, women, whereas in about 40 to 50% patients with endometriosis suffer from infertility. There are multiple factors involved in producing infertility. A higher basal activation status of peritoneal microphages in women with endometriosis may impair fertility by reducing sperm motility, increasing sperm phagocytosis, or interfering with fertilization, possibly by increased secretion of cytokines, such as tumor necrosis factor. My friends, in patients with endometriosis associated infertility don't forget about the role of hyperestrogenemia in their body and hyperestrogenemia or lack of progesterone hypoluteinism anovulation could be an isolated cause of infertility in this group of patients don't forget it Chronic pelvic pain. The pain varies from pelvic discomfort, low abdominal pain, or backache. The cause may be multifactorial. These include inflammation in the peritoneal implants and the release of PGF, and also due to adhesions and ovarian cysts. 
action of inflammatory cytokines released by the micro macrophages. Invasion of nerves or involvement of bladder and bowel. The pain aggravates during period. Abdominal pain. There may be variable degrees of abdominal pain around the period. Sometimes the pain may be acute due to rupture of chocolate cysts. Now I want to remind the possible sites of endometriosis. There are at this picture. The symptoms are related of the region involved. Urinary system, frequency, dysuria, back pain or even cyclic hematuria. Sigmoid colon and the rectum are accompanied by painful defecation, dyshesia, premenstrual tenesmus, diarrhea, constipation, rectal bleeding or even melina. Chronic fatigue, hemoptysis rarely, catamnial chest pain in lung location of endometrioid implants. Perimenstrual headache in case of brain location. Surgical scars are associated with cyclic pain and the bleeding from the scar. Signs. Abnormal palpation may not reveal any abnormality, especially in initial stage of the development of endometriosis. MS may be felt in the lower abdomen arising from the pelvis, in large chocolate cysts or tubavarian mass due to endometriotic adhesions. The mass is tender with restricted mobility. It's clear, my friends, because of involvement of surrounding tissues of nerves and plexuses leads to the symptom of pain. Sign of painful palpation and restricted mobility is easy to explain by the formation of peripheral adhesions. Speculum examination and the colposcopy may reveal bluish spots at the cervix or posterior phonix. You see these spots at these pictures. It's typical for endometriosis. And in external endometriosis, external genital endometriosis, these locations of disease are visible by colposcopy or even routine speculum examination, especially near, before, and after the menstruation. Biomanual examination may not reveal any pathology. Rectal or rectovaginal examination is often helpful to confirm the findings. The expected positive findings are pelvic tenderness, nodules in the pouch of Douglas, nodular fill of the uterus sacral ligaments, fixed rectroverted uterus or unilateral or bilateral adnexal mass of varying size. What do we differentiate with endometriosis? First of all, it's a chronic pelvic inflammatory disease or recurrent acute salpingitis. Because this disease is also, you know, you studied already the topic PID is accompanied by chronic pelvic pain. There are similar signs and symptoms of both endometriosis and the chronic inflammation of fallopian tubes and ovaries. Hemorrhagic corpus luteum is another pathology which is necessary to differentiate with endometriosis. Benign or malignant ovarian neoplasm. Of course, we mean, first of all, the differential diagnosis of this disease with endometriomas, endometrioid chocolate cysts. Ectopic pregnancy also demonstrates the enlargement of appendages, symptom of pain, 
but it's easy to differentiate with endometriosis because of ectopic pregnancy is characterized by the period of amenorrhea. Diagnosis is based on the history and examination, pelvic ultrasound, direct visualization of endometriotic lesions, pathological examination of biopsy specimen. Endometriosis, my friends, is not a clinical diagnosis. It's necessary to confirm it objectively. Suspected in a febrile patient with the characteristic triad, pelvic pain, firm fixed tender adnexal mass, tender nodularity in cul-de-sac and the uterus sacral, ligament clinical diagnosis is by the classic symptoms of progressively increasing secondary dysmenorrhea dyspareunia and infertility this is corroborated by the pelvic findings of nodules in the pouch of douglas nodular feel of the uterus sacral ligaments fixed retroverted uterus and unilateral or bilateral adnexal mass. However, physical examination has poor sensitivity and specificity. specificity. Many patients have no abnormal finding on examination. Serumachia CA-125 a moderate elevation of serum CA125 is noticed in patients with severe endometriosis. Sensitivity is only from 20 to 30 percent. It is not specific for endometriosis as it's significantly raised in epithelial ovarian carcinoma my friends i be believe you remember our lecture and discussion about this pathology however it is helpful to assess the therapeutic response and in follow-up of cases and detect any recurrence after therapy ultrasonography can detect ovarian endometrioma thirst Transvaginal and endorectal ultrasound found better for rectosigmoid endometriosis. Transvaginal sonogram demonstrating ovarian endometrioma assist with diffuse internal lower level echoes is seen. Color Doppler scan of an ovarian endometrioma chocolate cyst, internal echoes and the homogeneous content, increased vascularity you see in this part of picture is seen at the ovarian hilus. Magnetic resonance images of an endometrioma arouse just lateral to the rectum consistent with subacute blood low intensity signals are found on t2 weighted sequences high intensity signals are seen on t1 weighted sequence laparoscopy is the gold standard in the peritoneal endometriosis the benefits are Confirmation of the lesion with site, size, and the extent. Biopsy can be taken at the same time. Staging can be done. Extent of the adhesions could be recorded. Opportunity to do laparoscopic surgery if needed. At this picture, you see the possible sites for the diagnosis of endometriosis by laparoscopy. The classical lesion of pelvic endometriosis is described as red, dark brown, 
blue or black peritoneal implants powder burns or much thick spots of the peritoneum. Chocolate cyst of the ovary or the pouch of Douglas. Also, they could be clear vesicles, white or yellow spots, or nodules, or normal appearing of peritoneum. It's possible in microscopic initial stage of the disease when lesions are really invisible. Laparoscopic view of pelvic endometriosis. Left ovary, ovary endometriotic implants, right ovary chocolate cyst, small bowel endometriosis at this part of picture. Unfortunately, even the most experienced surgeons may fail to identify endometriosis implants because the elder implants may have a very subtle appearance. The deeper infiltration lesions may not be visible at the surface. Biopsy of suspicious lesions improves diagnostic accuracy. Biopsy confirmation of exceeded lesions is ideal, but negative histology does not exclude it. Staging, American Society of Reproductive Medicine. The current classification system of endometriosis is a revised American Fertility Society system. It is based on the appearance, size, depth of peritoneal and ovarian implants, the presence, extent, and the type of adnexal adhesions, and the degree of the cool de sac obliteration. This system reflects the extent of endometriotic disease, but it is not based on the correlation of pain or infertility, and it has considerable intra-observer and inter-observer variability. At this picture, you see the table which we use for the staging of intrapelvic genital and the metriosis. There are minimal lesions, mild lesions, moderate lesions, and the severe lesions. Treatment. Preventive treatment. The following guidelines may be prescribed to prevent or minimize endometriosis. To avoid tubal patency test, immediately after curatage of around the time of menstruation. Possible pelvic examination should not be done during or shortly after menstruation. Married women with family history of endometriosis are encouraged not to delay the first conception, but to complete their family. Curative. The objectives are to abolish or minimize the symptoms, pelvic pain and the dyspareunia, to improve the fertility, to prevent recurrence. What can we include into the management of patients with endometriosis? It can be non-hormonal treatment, hormonal treatment, surgical treatment, and very rarely radiological treatment. Non-hormonal treatment, if small lesions with mild symptoms is possible. Analgetics are given for pain. Prostaglandin inhibitors are given for pain and the menorrhagia. Hormonal treatment, indications for it are severe symptoms with small pelvic lesions, recurrence of symptoms after conservative surgery, may be given for a short time, from 6 to 12 weeks before surgery to make dissection easier. After conservative surgery to allow and any residual lesions to regress. One operation is contraindicated or refused by the patient. Effect of pseudo-pregnancy. In all patients, we try to achieve the effect of 
suppression of hyperproduction of estrogens from ovaries and extra ovarian site. For this aim, logical is the employment of progestins or progestogens. This is a family of hormones is often used of, uh, for endometriosis therapy. Progestational agents are known to antagonize estrogenic effects on the endometrium, causing initial decidualization and subsequent endometrial atrophy. For endometriosis treatment, progestins can be administered as an oral progestin pills, depot medroxyprogesterone acetate, noretisterone acetate, or levonergestrel releasing intrauterine system. Dianagest is another 19 nortestosterone synthetic progestin suitable for endometriosis. It is significantly effective orally at a dose of 2 mg daily in reducing of endometriosis associated pain. Efficiency is equivalent to that of GnRH agonist. We shall talk about this kind of treatment later. Side effects of progestogens. Sometimes headache, weight gain, fluid retention, bleeding and the depression. Ovulation and menstruation are inhibited for nine months from 6 to 18 using a combined oral contraceptives. The low-dose contraceptive pills may be prescribed either in a cyclic or continuous fashion with advantages in young patients with mild disease who want to defer pregnancy. It causes endometrial decidualization and atrophy. It may induce amenorrhea. It relieves dysmenorrhea. Today, it is not first-line treatment of endometriosis because it's less effective than progestogens, progestins. Danazol. Danazol is a synthetic 17-alpha-etinyl testosterone deriv derivative. Its predominant action suppresses the mid-cycle LH surge to promote chronic anovulation. Danazol occupies receptor sites on sex hormone binding globulin and thereby increases serum-3 testosterone levels. It's also bind directly to androgens and progesterone receptors. As a result, danazol creates a hypoestrogenic, hyperandrogenic state that induces endometrial atrophy in endometriotic implants. It has a spectrum of side effects that are demonstrated at this picture. Danazol therapy is to be started from the day 5th of the menstrual cycle. The dose 600 to 800 milligrams daily is variable and depends upon the extent of the lesions, but should be adequate enough to produce amenorrhea. The patient should use barrier methods of contraception to avoid virilization for a female fetus in accidental pregnancy. Resolution of endometriotic lesions has been seen in about 80% of cases, but the recurrence rate is very high, about 40%. The side effects are at times intense and intolerable to extent of discontinuation of the, ter discontinuation of the therapy. A few often persist even after their therapy. The drugs are now used as second-line agents of endometriosis due to their androgenic side effects. Gestrinone has got the same mechanism of action like that of danazol. The side effects are less than danazol. Administration is simple 
twice a week. Gene-rich agonists and the genus positive release of gene-rich agonists promote secretory activity of the gonadotropines within the anterior pituitary. Gonadotropine release from the pituitary then leads to ovarian steroidogenesis and ovulation. However, continuous non-positive GnRH administration results in the pituitary desensitization and subsequent loss of ovarian steroidogenesis. These features allow pharmacological use of GnRH agonists or and or for endometriosis treatment. The goal is to maintain a reduced level of serum estrogen so that growth of endometriosis is suppressed. There are representatives of gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists. There are nafarelin, gozarelin, tryptorelin. Of course, according to the nature of this drug, it's accompanied by side effects. There are hot flashes, dryness of the vagina, dyspareunia, reduced libid, libido, and my friends, most important, most dangerous consequence of GnRH agonist employment is osteoporosis. As a result, we are limited in our employment of GnRH agonists. What can we do also? Aromatase inhibitors, my friends. It is well known that in endometriotic tissue, estrogen may be produced locally through aromatization of circulating androgens. This may clarify postmenopausal endometriosis or may explain causes in which symptoms persist despite conventional treatment. Hormonal strategies described in prior secretion target ovarian estrogen production but have a little effect of an estrogen produced from other sources. In contrast, the aromatase inhibitors block aromatase action and estradiol production in both the ovary and extra ovarian sites. As a result, estrogen levels are dramatically suppressed and they have hyperestrogenic side effects less to those of GnRH agonists. As assumed, the efficiency of the hormone therapy is judged by relief of symptoms, reduction of the volume of the lesion as revealed by second look laparoscopy, improvement of fertility and prevention of recurrence. For quick relief of symptoms and reduction of the volume of the lesion, progestogens take some time to achieve these objectives, but don't accompany it by hard side effects. Now in modern conditions, my friends, progestogens is the first line of treatment of conservative management of patients with endometriosis. Generate analogs are accompanied by spectrum of side effects and needed in the back estrogen therapy. But my friends, additionally, estrogens may have such effect as induction of the development of endometriosis. Danazol now is not popular drug because of its side effects. Following medical suppression, residual endometriotic lesions may regenerate once the ovarian function is re-established. Overall recurrence rate is about 40% after five years. Surgical treatment. Indications for surgery are endometriosis with severe symptoms unresponsive to hormone therapy, severe and deeply infiltrating endometriosis to correct the distortion of pelvic anatomy, endometriosis of more than four centimeters. Attention, please, my friends. 
Only endometriosis of more than 4 centimeters are indication for the surgery. How it's possible to explain it? My friends, be very attentive and gentle with ovaries in patients in reproductive age. Every invasion, every operation of on ovaries is dangerous for the future, future fertility. Try to avoid it, but if endometrioma achieved the size four centimeters or more, it is indication for surgery. And of course, endometriosis associated in fertility is also the indication for surgery. Surgery could be conservative or radical. Conservative measures include laparoscopic method, cauterization, laser vaporization, laparoscopical uterosacral nerve ablation, adhesial, adhesial lesis, excision of recta vaginal nodules, and the treatment of endometrioma, aspiration and irrigation, cyst wall vaporization, cyst Ectomy. Definitive surgery, laparoscopy or laparotomy approaches. Hysterectomy with bilateral self and glopharectomy. Resection of bowel or ureters may be needed in advanced stages of the process. Conservative surgery is indicated if the patient is young. Minimal to mild disease can be removed by laser or electrocautery. Conservative surgery is planned to destroy the endometriotic lesions and an attempt to improve the symptoms, pain, subfertility, and at the same time to preserve the reproductive function. Laparoscopy is commonly done to destroy endometriotic lesions by excision or ablation by electroradiotherapy or by laser vaporization. Conservative surgical treatment in minimal to mild endometriosis ablation plus adhesiolysis improves the fertility outcome. At this picture, you see the laparoscopic operation for the patients with endometriosis. Ovarian endometriosis. In small endometriosis, and, and, and endometriosis less than three centimeters, is aspirated laparoscopically. The cyst cavity is irrigated with normal saline. Cyst wall epithelium is destroyed by laser vaporization. Large endometriosis endometriomas is often associated with extensive adhesions to other pelvic structures. Laparoscopy is necessary for ovarian cystectomy and adhesia lysis. At this picture, you see the dissection of an endometrioma. Different steps. You see the fallopian tube, the ovary affected by endometrioma, its incision, removal, and the result of the operation. Radical surgery. For the patients above 40 years, no prospect for fertility improvement. Other forms of treatment have failed. Women with completed family. Treatment is total hysterectomy and bilateral self engulfarectomy along with the resection of endometrial tissue as complete as possible. Preoperative hormonal therapy aims a reduction of the size and vascularity of the lesion which facilitate surgery. The idea of postoperative hormonal therapy is to destroy the residual lesions left behind after surgery and to control the pain. But it does not improve fertility. It is generally avoided. And now radiological treatment. Induction of artificial menopause is the aim of this treatment by external pelvic radiation curses due to condition by causing atrophy of endometrial tissues. It is applied only in patients above 40 in whom operation can't be done 
as in case of widespread pelvic endometriosis, we call it frozen pelvis or endometriosis of the rectovaginal septum, which is difficult to excise surgically. Really, radiological treatment is uncommon kind of management of patients with endometriosis. Thank you for your attention, my friends. Have you any questions? What is difficult for you, my friends? Have you any questions, my friends? Please write. Anybody? No? Pranoti, no questions from you? What about others? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, my friends. We shall come back to endometriosis during our discussion with both groups. Now you have a time to work with clinical cases, and then we shall continue with the discussion about these cases. You are welcome, my friends. Goodbye. See you at discussion. Thank you.